It is good to be with you again tonight. I hope you are all having a good week. This is Tuesday when I'm recording this and I'm actually down at Governor Dodge State Park again. You may remember a few weeks ago I was at Eni Point and did the classroom up there. But today I came down here to do some kayaking on Twin Valley Lake, so one of the lakes here. And I actually tried recording the class a little bit earlier today and had a hard time. For some reason the computer crashed and I had to stop that and uh, so I just that I'll go kayaking and I'll try again later on class so we'll see how this goes and I was by the beach before and uh, people started coming and you know kids with floaties on their arms and that kind of thing so it's getting busy around here but a beautiful day I believe today Tuesday is the first day of fall so we see the changing of the seasons and it is just a, a beautiful day today so I'm thankful to be here and I'm glad that you're able to join us uh, tonight when you're watching this on Wednesday evening. If you have any updates to the prayer concerns, I hope you'll let me know. Uh, get in touch, send an email to the contact information that'll be on the screen in just a little bit. And please also remember that we're continuing to meet for worship two times every Sunday. We're having two services, at uh, one at 9 a.m., one at 10.30 a.m., and we're also doing the online sign-up through Sign Up Genius, and that really, really helps. And we had some visitors this past Sunday. And when all of us sign up as we're supposed to, it makes it a lot easier for me to just tell our visitors when they call, uh, come to whichever service you want. And uh, that's the way it worked this past Sunday, so I'm thankful for that. If you need any help signing up, if that's not working for you, let me know or get in touch with Kenna. We'd be able to, uh, we'd be glad to get, get you help there. If you have anything that we need to be praying about, send me an email or give me a call if you're joining us on the phone. Uh, my number is 608-224-0274. We'd love to update the prayer list if we can. Uh, in our prayers, let's continue remembering the seniors of the congregation. Uh, we have some seniors at the Four Lakes congregation who have not been out for six or seven months now, and it can be kind of difficult. And so remember them in your prayers and uh, keep them in mind and uh, see if there's anything we can do to try to encourage them. And for some of them, it has been rather difficult. So we want to remember them uh, in our thoughts and prayers. All right, tonight we get back to our study of the book of Luke. And so I hope you can turn with me to Luke chapter 18 and also chapter 19. By way of review, we know Luke is a Gentile. He is a medical doctor. He writes both Luke and Acts to a man by the name of Theophilus. Theophilus is apparently some kind of wealthy sponsor, perhaps, or somebody that Luke is trying to teach the gospel. And he makes a point of writing in chronological order. And so, as we might expect from a physician, this is a well-researched account. We assume there were interviews involved. He talked to people. He talked to eyewitnesses, although he himself was not an eyewitness. He heard the gospel from others. But he researches. He puts it down in chronological order. We also know he includes a number of people who were often excluded in the ancient Jewish world. Uh, and those who were sometimes oppressed, widows, women, Gentiles, Samaritans, the sick, and a number of tax collectors in this book. We're going to see that again tonight. Last week, by way of just brief review, we looked at the first half of Luke 18, where among other things, we looked at the parable of the unjust judge. And in a follow-up to class last week, I can't remember who it is or whether you talked to me in person or text or email or whatever it was, maybe a phone call, but one of our members mentioned that it was rather appropriate that we studied a judge last Wednesday evening. Right before, judges are pretty much all we're talking about right now. Um, obviously, with the passing of Justice Ginsburg, this has been in the news. Uh, for the past several days, and it will be for the coming months. But the parable that we studied last week was about a judge who feared neither God nor man. But we was, he was getting constantly harassed by a widow who was needing legal protection. Remember Luke's focus on widows. There's a good example of that. And so this woman, this widow, harassed the judge, asking him over and over and over again to protect her legally, and finally, he gave her what she wanted, not because he cared, not because he loves God, not because he fears God, but rather because he feared his reputation. If this woman kept up this constant begging, she would give him a black eye, almost literally there. Uh, in the parable, uh, Jesus was not comparing God to an evil judge. That's a mistake many people make when they look at that parable. But rather, he was comparing us to the widow. And so, like the widow did, we also need to be constantly taking our concerns to God in prayer. 
if it doesn't seem like our prayers are going through, we need to keep trying and pray those prayers over and over again. Not meaningless repetition, but we need to pray with, uh, with uh, fervency. Uh, we then had last week the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And there, those were the two men who went into the temple to pray. Uh, the Pharisee prayed to himself. He wasn't praying to God. He was praying to himself, a very selfish prayer. And the tax collector had a completely different attitude, not arrogant at all, the opposite of it. God be merciful to me, the sinner. And Jesus explains that the tax collector is the one who went away justified that day. And in the same way, uh, we also today need to be praying with humility, not looking down on others as we pray. Uh, in the parallel accounts, we had the Lord's teaching on divorce and remarriage. We didn't really dig into that. That was in the other accounts in Matthew 19 and Mark 10, but we just noted that this is where it would go. Uh, we had the children coming to Jesus and the disciples turning them away. And then we had Jesus' interaction with the rich young ruler. You may remember that that young man made some very good choices up to that point in his life. He followed the commandments. He seemed to be a decent, moral human being. And yet God still was not number one in his life. And so Jesus, knowing his heart, had to tell this young man to sell everything and to give it to the poor, which the man was unwilling to do. And so he walks away. And we learn from that that it is nearly impossible for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And we learned last week that we are wealthy, almost all of us at the congregation. Any Americans would be considered wealthy by the world's standards. And so we need to be very careful to use our wealth freely, uh, helping those in need and always putting God first. So tonight we get back with the rest of Luke 18. We also hope to make it through the first 10 verses of Luke 19. And we will be using the Harmony of the Gospels tonight. In case you're interested, the Harmony is available on Amazon for about 25 bucks. And it's basically just the four gospel accounts arranged in columns parallel to one another so we can compare and contrast and it's not necessary. We could do the flipping back and forth very quickly, uh, but this way we have everything arranged in parallel fashion in chronological order. And I'm just saying that again because it will be useful tonight starting here at the beginning. Because between Luke 18 verse 30 and Luke 18 verse 31, we have a passage that's not in Luke. So we have Matthew 20, 1 through 16 inserted in here if it had all been in chronological order together. This is the parable of the landowner. And you may remember this is the parable where the landowner goes out, he hires different people at different times throughout the day, uh, promising to pay them whatever is right. And at the end of the day, he pays everybody the same. And obviously those who worked all day, they're upset because they get the same thing as the people who were hired at the 11th hour. So the point is, uh, the landowner can pay people whatever he wants to. He is the landowner. And then in chronological order, we pick up tonight with Luke 18.31. And so I hope you're there with me by now. Luke 18.31 through verse 34. Luke 18.31 through 34. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon and after they have scourged him, they will kill him, and the third day he will rise again. But the disciples understood none of these things, and the meaning of this statement was hidden from them, and they did not comprehend the things that were said. And so as Jesus is starting to make this final trek toward Jerusalem, he takes the twelve aside, he tries to break this to them very slowly, very gently, uh, and he basically says here, whatever is about to happen it will be the fulfillment of the prophecies from the law of Moses and so on and so Jesus says all things that are written about him in the prophets will be accomplished and so this is a pretty huge leap the man they are talking to Jesus is the fulfillment of all prophecy and in their minds they're probably as we've discussed before thinking about the Messiah as a military leader as a political leader somebody who will come in uh, take care of business, throw off the yoke of Roman oppression, uh, make Israel great again, we might say. Um, the Messiah will come in with a huge army, and he's going to dominate, and he's going to make everything right. You know, this is in their minds. This is going to be an awesome thing. 
Uh, the nation of Israel would be respected again, and everybody's going to love us, and we'll be powerful. It'll be like the good old days under King David. However, that's not exactly what Jesus predicts here, is it? Instead of overthrowing the military, instead of some amazing victory, notice he predicts that in the near future he will be handed over to the Gentiles. He will be mocked. He will be mistreated. He will be spit upon. And after being scourged, they will kill him. However, on the third day, he will rise again. And we notice in verse 34 that the disciples understand none of these things. This goes completely over their heads. In other words, they have absolutely no idea whatsoever what Jesus is talking about. In fact, Luke says that the meaning is hidden from them. And when I hear about something being hidden, I almost think about the parables. Jesus spoke in parables so that the message would be hidden, but it would be obvious later when they had a deeper understanding of it. So maybe that's what's going on here. And so they have no clue about any of this. Uh, Jesus speaks the words, and we look back over this paragraph. The words are not difficult words. They're not big words. They're not words we have to look up in a dictionary to understand. And yet when you put all that together, the apostles just did not understand this. They are completely clueless. And I'm trying to picture this from Luke's first reader's point of view, the people who opened this book for the first time. As Theophilus and his friends sat around uh, reading this for the first time, maybe 30 years after the fact, I'm thinking they might appreciate this. Yes, we might be late to the Christian faith. We might not understand everything. We might think some of this is over our heads. But you know what? The same thing is true of the apostles. And they spent three and a half years with the Lord, and they still didn't get it at the end of those three years. And so I'm thinking that might have been some consolation to uh, the people who were reading the book of Luke, Theophilus and the others for the very first time. I'm thinking that would have been encouraging. Uh, we're not the only ones who have a hard time getting it. Matthew and Mark, by the way, specifically mention uh, Jesus being turned over to the chief priest and the scribes. But Luke leaves this out. He doesn't mention the chief priest and the scribes. And so that wasn't really important to Luke's audience. They were Greeks. They don't care about some of that. And it wasn't as important as it was for uh, those who read Matthew and Mark for the first time. So it's not here. Uh, Luke, though, is the only one who points out that the disciples understood none of this. And so, again, there's a reason for that. Uh, there is some encouragement there to those who are reading it for the first time. All right, if you're in the harmony, as we move forward, you'll notice uh, that we have Matthew 20, 20 through 28, and Mark 10, 35 through 45, where James and John, or their mother, depending on the account, uh, they ask that they might sit at Jesus' right and left hand on each side of his throne, basically, when he comes in his kingdom. Remember, in chronological order, this comes right after Jesus talking about all of the prophecies about the Son of Man being accomplished. And so they're like, oh, yeah, we, we want in on that. We want to be, you know, his right and left hand men kind of thing. And uh, Jesus warns them again here, though, that his kingdom isn't that kind of kingdom. It's not about that. It's not about national pride and, and military might and all that. But instead, there is some serious suffering on the horizon. And he points that out in Matthew and Mark. And again, we need to remember this takes place at some point during the winter before Jesus is crucified in the spring. And so just a few months out, and some of the Lord's most faithful followers uh, still don't get it. They're still thinking of Jesus as some kind of military or political leader and earthly king. Uh, right as I'm going through this for about the third time, I noticed something for the very first time here. Is that bugging you on the screen right now? Matthew in all caps, and Mark isn't. That's just bugging me to death right here. Anyway, I thought I'd point that out, so now it can bug you too. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, just thought I'd just point it out so, uh, so now you can appreciate it. All right, in chronological order, we pick up with Luke 18, 35 through 43. So I hope you're with me now in Luke 18, 35 through 43. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by, and he called out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him, and when he came near, he questioned him, What do you want me to do for you? And he 
said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. Uh, this account is found in Matthew 20, Mark 10, and also here in Luke chapter 18. So again, if you've got a harmony of the Gospels, it's all on one page. Otherwise, if you want to flip back and forth, Matthew 20, Mark 10, and here in Luke 18. Uh, we do have some differences between these three accounts. And these are differences that some people have latched onto, and they've said, ah, contradictions in the Bible, that kind of thing. So let's go through some of these. Uh, notice Luke starts with Jesus approaching Jericho. So on his way into town is when some of this happens. If you'll notice, Matthew starts with Jesus going out from Jericho, and so his way out of town. Mark starts by saying, and they came to Jericho, and as he was going out from Jericho. <laughs> and so in Matthew, he's on the way out. In Luke, he's on the way in. And in Mark, he's both coming and going. He's on his way in, and then he goes out. So I think when we look at all of these together, it seems then, as I understand this, he probably meets the blind men on his way into town. Some of these things happen as they pass through, but the healing doesn't happen until he's leaving. At least that's one possibility, and I think we can explain it in that way without uh, doing damage to Scripture and with respecting these three accounts as being perfect and inspired just from different points of view. So we just need to at least be aware that this is one issue with laying these accounts out side by side. There are no contradictions. Uh, but the account clearly comes from three different viewpoints. The other issue is that Matthew mentions two men, while Mark and Luke only mention one. And if we were together in person, I might ask, what's going on there? How might we explain that? How do, how do we explain that? How do we explain two blind men in Matthew and only one in Mark and Luke? Uh, personally, I'm thinking that one of the men was probably quite a bit more vocal. Than the others one might have been more of a leader and we know that we see that with people we have two people that we meet on the street one of them is the one that we talk to and the other one is just along for the ride and I'm saying that could be one possibility here uh, one of the men might have been more well known than the other and so he was the one who stands out in that regard um, the conversation was primarily between Jesus and one man although two men were actually healed so I, I think we can say this because Mark and Luke never say that there was only only one uh, Mark gives us a name, by the way, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, and Luke refers to a certain blind man. So no real contradiction here, but we do need to be aware that there are some differences between the three accounts. Uh, with both of these issues, whether he was on his way in or out, whether there were one or two, I might compare it to, if we could imagine a well-known politician coming to Madison and giving a speech, if we could picture that, some kind of rally, we might have coverage from the Wisconsin State Journal, NPR, WIBA, and maybe a local blogger, okay? Four accounts of a politician coming to Madison and giving a speech. All four of those accounts might be very accurate, but they report from different points of view and they report on different aspects of the visit. Who the guy talked to, what was said, where he ate, and so on, where he stayed or, or whatever. And I think we see something similar with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and at least the three with the account here. Uh, here in Luke, the blind man is sitting by the side of the road. He's begging by the side of the road. Do we see that today? Do we see people by the side of the road asking for money? Uh, here in Madison, we've seen even more of this, I believe, over the past few months. Men and women standing at intersections with uh, the cardboard, cardboard signs asking for money. And I, that's pretty much what's going on here. Bartimaeus is begging, and as he's sitting there by the side of the road, he hears this huge crowd go by. Imagine that. Imagine being blind and, and hearing hundreds, if not thousands, of people walking through this town. If we can try to put ourselves in his place, imagine what that would have been like to be blind and to hear that. I'd be worried about getting stepped on or trampled. If I were blind, I couldn't see people coming, but I could hear them. Um, I might be curious. What in the world is this? Why are all these people here? But we also might see an opportunity, right? If we're begging by the side of the road and all of a sudden there are thousands of people coming through, where there are crowds, there might also be money. There might also be somebody generous passing through. And so he starts to ask, what's going on? And the crowd explains that Jesus of Nazareth is coming through. 
And at that moment, as soon as he knows it's Jesus, he calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And I just want us to notice the man seems to perhaps know something about Jesus already. And I say that because he knows that Jesus is the son of David. I don't think from the accounts that they tell him Jesus, the son of David, is coming through. They just say Jesus or whatever. And so at this point, Jesus stops and he commands that the man be brought to him. And so probably fighting through some crowds there. And Mark tells us that the man leaves his cloak behind and comes and jumps up and, and comes to Jesus. And I'm thinking that for a blind man to leave his coat behind, what does that tell us? He's probably pretty excited. You'd be fearing that you'd lose it, never see it again or never have it again, I should say. Uh, but I'd be worried about losing my coat in the crowd or having it stolen, especially if I couldn't see it. Uh, but this man jumps up, he leaves his coat behind, and Jesus questions the man, what do you want me to do for you? It's kind of a probing question, and, and Jesus does this a few times. It's a bit strange to ask a blind man what he wants, um, but it seems to maybe be a test of faith. In other words, there's a chance Jesus is trying to see where this man is spiritually. He's testing. What does he know about Jesus? Uh, but since Jesus knows our hearts, I'm thinking it's probably more for the blind man's benefit. There's a value to putting our request into words. Speaking of prayer, God knows what we want, so why do we pray? Well, there's a value in asking, and uh, we, we think through things. Sometimes answering a question can be a growth process. And so this man answers, Lord, I want to regain my sight. How interesting there. He doesn't ask for money, but he seems to know that Jesus is capable of this. And so the Lord answers that prayer or that request and he ties the healing to the man's faith and so Jesus sees his faith and Jesus sees that the man believes and and Jesus does what he does here uh, at the end the formerly blind man joins in with the crowd and begins following Jesus along with the others now considering we only have a record of what happens on maybe 40 45 days during the life of Jesus out of three and a half years I'm guessing probably quite a few of these crowds had probably also been healed or helped by Jesus in some way. They were cured of various illnesses or blindness or demon possessions, and so they jumped on board, and they jumped in line and, and continued following him. They were following for some very good reasons. As they get closer to Jerusalem, uh, they're now uh, in Jericho or passing through, and they come to uh, this transition from chapter 18 to chapter 19. So we move now over to Luke 19 verses 1 through 10. This will be our last paragraph tonight. Luke 19 verses 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, Half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. In the harmony, you may notice nothing gets inserted here between chapters 18 and 19, and so Jesus goes directly from healing the blind men to meeting Zacchaeus there in Jericho. And as with the last paragraph, Jesus is traveling. He's on the move. He's passing through. He's walking and talking. And that may account for some of the parallel issues there. We have this from different points of view. Not that any of them are wrong, but they're just from different perspectives. And in the city of Jericho, we have this man. And this man that we meet here is absolutely perfect for the book of Luke, isn't he? Remember, Luke wants to focus on outcast and those who were outsiders. This man is the book of Luke. <laughs> the book of Luke 
is Zacchaeus, basically. This has Zacchaeus written all over it. And um, notice his defining characteristics. He's a tax collector, he's rich, and he is short. And we just talked about tax collectors last week. Most people have an issue with tax collectors. Uh, but these people collected taxes not for your own government that you can at least appreciate and are thankful for. These men collected taxes for the Roman government, an occupying enemy force. Notice, though, this man isn't just a tax collector, isn't he? He is a chief tax collector, and so he is a manager of other tax collectors. He is the super-duper tax collector. And uh, I think we can probably safely assume this guy is good at what he does. All right, he's good at getting money out of people, a lot of money, and he's even managing others who are now doing the same thing. And so we find that Zacchaeus is rich. He is a wealthy man. And again, uh, this goes back to him being a tax collector. So where did that money come from? It came from the people that he was basically perhaps defrauding it from. He would collect taxes and a little more and would have the Roman soldiers to back him up there. So the money came from the people. Um, just last week, didn't we learn it was pretty much impossible for the rich to be saved? Well, here we are. We got a rich man, a really rich man. And here we see Jesus actively concerned about a rich man. So just because it's hard for the rich to be saved doesn't mean Jesus doesn't care. Uh, Jesus wants everybody to be saved. It's more difficult for some than others, but he wants to include everybody. And so Jesus is concerned even about the rich. But we'll get back to that in just a moment. We also find that he's short. He's a short guy. And as we perhaps have sung at some point in the past, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. It's hard to see, say that without singing it, but I, I will spare you tonight. Uh, and the crowds, they come through Jericho. This man tries to see Jesus. How, how's that for interesting? Here's a blind man who couldn't see Jesus. Zacchaeus, who has his vision, but is unable to see Jesus because of the crowds. And so he can't see over all the regular sized people. And so he climbs up into a tree. So this man has no dignity whatsoever. Uh, I'm trying to remember the last time that I saw a grown man climb a tree to see something. That would be never. I have never seen a grown man climb a tree in order to see something. Uh, we have seen grown men climb trees in order to cut them down. Uh, there's an interesting show online about lumberjacks from the Pacific Northwest, and it's pretty interesting. But uh, Zacchaeus is not a lumberjack. He's a rich guy. Uh, he's hated by just about everybody. He's short. He's a traitor to his people. He's wealthy, and he is climbing a tree but he wants to see Jesus. And he's making the effort, isn't he? He's working at it. He doesn't say, oh, well, I can't, you know, maybe next time I'll catch him later. Nothing like that. Um, but it's rather undignified for a grown man to be climbing a tree, but he does it to see the Lord. And when Jesus walks by, notice that he sees Zacchaeus and he looks at him, makes eye contact, and he calls him by his name, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus has probably been called quite a few things in his life. But Jesus calls him by his name. Somehow Jesus knows his name and he uses it. And he says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for today. I must stay at your house. One of my old college professors, David Light, always points out that this would have been the perfect opportunity to preach a sermon about the evils of tax collecting. And it would have been a very popular sermon, very popular with the people, popular with the crowds. As he said, oh, there's Zacchaeus. What a low-down, dirty, rotten, thieving kind of man you are, taking the money from your own people. And Jesus could have preached a sermon like that. He could have come down really hard on this. He could have included scripture from the law of Moses, could have made some great points, very visual illustration there with this short guy in a tree. But Jesus doesn't do that, does he? Instead of embarrassing the man, Jesus sees him as a soul. And he sees him not for what he is at the moment, but Jesus sees this man for what he has the potential to become. And so instead of calling him out publicly, instead of embarrassing him publicly, Jesus 
invites himself over for dinner. How cool is that? I have not yet mastered that. Uh, some preachers are good at that, inviting yourself into somebody's house for dinner. I, I can do it when needed, uh, but I have not yet mastered that skill. But it's a good skill to have, to invite yourself into someone's home for dinner. But that's what Jesus does here, doesn't he? Zacchaeus, I must come to your house. Um, Zacchaeus then scurries down the tree, and he receives Jesus as a guest in his home. Meanwhile, notice how the people in the crowd react. They complain. Jesus has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And we've seen this before. Uh, just a thought question. How many people in this crowd are sinners? Well, I think the answer is all of them. All of the adults who are old enough to be accountable. All of them are sinners. And Zacchaeus, though, to them, he's a special kind of sinner. He is a tax collector. And I know as human beings there is a general tendency for us to rank some sins as being worse than others. There's murder up here and a little other stuff down here and everything else is kind of in between. And I know we understand some sins do have more severe consequences than others. We understand that. And yet we also need to understand, spiritually speaking, all sin, any sin, separates us from God. And in that sense, all sin is equal. It may have different consequences here on this earth, but all sin separates us from God. These people, they don't understand that. They see Zacchaeus as being much worse than they are. They're taking the attitude of the Pharisee from the previous chapter. And now Jesus, he's maybe approving of this. And so they're going to nail him on that. Well, that brings us back to Jesus and Zacchaeus. At some point in this process, Zacchaeus just spills it, doesn't he? He just pours his heart out to the Lord. He confesses. He has a change of heart. He might not have everything figured out to the penny at this point in terms of what he's going to do. But he sees the big picture. He sees what he's done. He sees what he needs to do. And his conclusion is he will give half of everything that he owns to the poor. Now contrast that with the guy from the last chapter where Jesus told him to sell 100% and he was unwilling. Here, Jesus, as far as we know, doesn't demand this, but Zacchaeus seems to come up with this on his own. And then he goes on. And he says if he's defrauded anyone of anything, he will pay back four times as much. And so again, he might not have the details. He's still got to work through that, but this is the concept. And what's interesting is Luke doesn't tell us that Jesus demands this. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. We don't have the conversation. We just have the results of it. We're coming in here at the end. And so whatever Jesus and Zacchaeus talked about over this meal, um, all we have is what happens next. Zacchaeus has a change of heart. Uh, by the way, it's a bit interesting that Zacchaeus uh, does not seem to promise to give up tax collecting as a career, does he? That's not part of this promise. He doesn't say, Jesus, and beyond this, I will stop being a tax collector. He doesn't say that. And I point that out because tax collecting is, in fact, an honorable profession. Somebody needs to do it. And yet we find here that Zacchaeus is dedicating his life to being honest and fair going forward and making some form of restitution. We think about the tax collectors who came to be baptized by John the Baptist earlier in this book. And remember, they asked John the Baptist, teacher, what shall we do in terms of repentance? What does this message mean for us exactly? And you may remember John said to them, collect no more than what you have been ordered to. And that seems to be what's going on here with Zacchaeus. After Zacchaeus has the change of heart, the Lord's conclusion is, today salvation has come to this house. It's a bit strange how Jesus points out that he too is a son of Abraham. I think we know he's Jewish, so he's always been a son of Abraham as far as we can tell. And so I'm assuming Jesus is perhaps emphasizing that he too is a son of Abraham. In other words, his faith is like Abraham at this point. And also, He's just as much a child of God, just as much a child of Abraham, as these people out here in the crowds complaining about what a sinner he is. And so there are a couple different aspects of that. And the highlight of this passage, I think, comes at the end, as Jesus reveals his whole purpose for coming to this earth. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. If you have ever been lost, and if you've ever had someone come looking for you, either physically or spiritually, I think you probably appreciate this more than most. 
Jesus came to this earth to seek and to save the lost. That was his mission. And if that was his mission, it also needs to be our mission as well. It needs to be something we're praying about. It needs to be something we're planning for. It needs to be something that we're actually doing. Getting the word of God out there in the world with the people that we know. So I hope this lesson has been helpful. I am so thankful for those of you who were able to join us tonight, either online or on the phone. Uh, be sure to send me any prayer concerns so I can get those in the bulletin. The next two Sundays, Lord willing, uh, we'll be considering sermons based on requests from those of you who are joining us on the phone line. And so I only got two requests, and so if you have something, if you're joining us on the phone, there's something that we need to cover in the near future, let me know, and I'd be glad to fit that in. Uh, but next week, let's come prepared for our next study by reading the rest of Luke 19. So we'll finish Luke 19, if the Lord wills, next week. Uh, and then after next week, Josh Yancey will actually be teaching for three weeks. I'm heading out to visit my sister in Washington State, and then when I get back, we may take a few weeks off of Luke uh, before jumping back into it with a couple independent studies. And so there's a good breaking point between chapters 19 and 20. We're going to take advantage of that. So I'm just saying next week might be our last study of Luke for a little while before we jump into the final few chapters. Uh, let's go to God in prayer as we close. Our Father in heaven, you are the God who gives sight to the blind. And we praise you tonight for your mercy and grace and for the love that you've shown to us. You are a God who sent your only Son to this world to save sinners, to seek and to save the lost. We pray that we would open our eyes to see the lost, that we would get to know them, that we would call them by name as Jesus did, and that we'd have the courage to speak up, even inviting ourselves into homes if that's what it takes. Tonight we ask for your continued blessings on our seniors. Bless those who are struggling with their health. We pray that you would bless those who are struggling with their faith as well. You are a God who seeks and saves, and we ask that we might join you in that mission. We come to you in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior.